Hi, it's Richard Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, also richarddwyer.co. Let's give an update on the George Floyd murder case. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, I don't know what the jury is going to do. Juries, quite frankly, are unpredictable. I'm going to speak for myself. Now, I'm a lay person, not a doctor. In a case with medical issues, I'm relying on getting clarity from the prosecution if I'm going to vote in their favor beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> the burden of proof matters. It is not enough for me to feel that the prosecution did a better job. This can't be a 60%, 40% situation. No, the prosecution has to be clear. They have to remove all reasonable doubt that I have. It has to be 99% to 1%. It has to be clear. It can't be ambiguous. Now for me, the most important witness in the case was the Emmy who did the autopsy. Right? In my opinion, percipient witnesses, people who actually observe things, are far more valuable than paid expert witnesses. So what I'm going to do here, because I feel in this case there is not enough to convict for murder two, for murder three, or for the manslaughter charge. Right? In my opinion, based on the portions of the record that I have read, there simply is not enough to convict. Put differently, the prosecution has not met their burden. They have not proven the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? Let me just say, I understand the anger. I'm a black man in America, and when I saw the film, I was angry. But either the facts matter or they don't. So what I'm going to do here, because we're just going to make this as factual as possible. What I'm going to do here is in the comment section to this video, I'm going to attach the transcript from a liberal source, CNN. Write the transcript of portions of medical examiner Dr. Baker's testimony at this trial. I believe this portion of the testimony, quite frankly, makes it impossible for the prosecution to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. I'll refer to the individuals as defense counsel and Dr. Baker. Okay? Understand, too, when you do a court transcript, there are different drafts of that transcript. As I read this, some words are going to seem to be missing because, understand, the court reporter does as good a job as he or she can, but they'll miss some words at first, right? This was a preliminary transcript that was rushed out. It might seem like some portions are missing. This is what was presented by CNN. Again, I have a link to this transcript in the comment section of this YouTube video. Defense counsel, all right. I just want to kind of review with you the history of your involvement in this case, if that's okay. Dr. Baker, okay. Defense counsel, you obviously 
Mr. Floyd was deceased on February, or excuse me, May 25th of 2020, correct? Dr. Baker, correct. Defense counsel, you performed the autopsy on the 26th. Dr. Baker, yes. Defense counsel, and after the autopsy, you had a meeting with some Hennepin County attorneys, correct? Dr. Baker, correct. Defense counsel, on May 26th, correct? Dr. Baker, yes. Defense counsel, and do you recall telling them that the autopsy revealed no physical evidence that Mr. Floyd died of asphyxiation? Dr. Baker, I don't know that. I don't know what specific language is, but yes, that is what I conveyed to them was the lack of anatomical findings that would support that conclusion. Defense counsel, all right. And you tell them that you had avoided watching the videos at that point, right? Dr. Baker, until after I performed the autopsy. Yes. Defense counsel, all right. Do you recall telling them certain factors that you thought contributed to the death? Their objections. Right? The judge then says, consider any statements made outside of court as possible impeachment of the witness's testimony and not what is actually being asserted. Mr. Nelson, defense counsel, you may ask that question. Defense counsel, thank you. Do you recall telling the Hennepin County Attorney's Office on May 26th, after you conducted your autopsy, what you thought the contributing factors were to his death? Dr. Baker, I don't recall the specifics of that conversation. As far as I know, the only narrative record of that conversation would be what they wrote down. I would be shocked if I did not tell them about Mr. Floyd's heart condition, because obviously I knew that the moment the autopsy was done. I couldn't have known the toxicology results the afternoon of the autopsy, because I wouldn't have those back for several more days. Defense counsel. So you found initially his heart condition was pretty significant, right? Dr. Baker, yes. You would know that walking out of the autopsy suite. Defense counsel, you received a toxicology on June 1st of 2020. Dr. Baker, can I refer to my record and see if that's correct? Defense counsel, yes, on or about June 1st. Dr. Baker, that is correct, and I'm going off the toxicology report itself. It appears it was issued on the morning of June 1st at 7.04. Defense counsel, okay. Do you recall having a conversation with Hennepin County prosecutors about the significance of the toxicology findings? Dr. Baker, I recall having the conversation. I don't recall the specifics of it but I'm certain that I would have relayed the toxicology findings to them. Defense counsel, do you recall describing the level of fentanyl as a fatal level of fentanyl? Dr. Baker, I recall describing it in other circumstances. It would be a fatal level, yes, in other circumstances. Defense counsel, would you agree that one of the causes of the pulmonary edema that you communicated to the county attorney was also fentanyl? Dr. Baker, fentanyl can certainly be a cause of pulmonary edema, as I indicated earlier in previous questioning. It's confounded by the fact he had a bit of CPR, and so I find the pulmonary edema much less specific, given that he survived and made it to the hospital for a period of time. Defense counsel, 
Do you recall telling the county attorney's office that had you found Mr. Floyd under different circumstances, you would have determined this to be a fentanyl overdose? Dr. Baker, so I don't recall specifically what I told the county attorney, but it almost certainly went something like this. Had Mr. Floyd been home alone in his locked residence with no evidence of trauma and the only autopsy finding was that fentanyl level, then yes, I would certify his death due to fentanyl toxicity. Again, interpret interpretation of drug concentrations is very context dependent. Defense counsel. You then were also interviewed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on or about July 8th of 2020. Dr. Baker, I believe it was the Federal Bureau of Investigation and or the U.S. Attorney. A lot of these took place over video calls and I wasn't entirely sure who was who at all times, but I believe it was those two groups, yes. Defense counsel, and that occurred on July 8th of 2020, correct? Dr. Baker, to the best of my recollection, yes. Defense counsel, all right. Were you asked but for type questions? Dr. Baker, I was. Defense counsel, were you able to form an opinion on but for the involvement of law officers whether Mr. Floyd would have died under these circumstances. There's an objection. The judge says overruled. This is not the legal standard, simply as diagnosis. You can go forward on that, basically. Dr. Baker, so I'll answer the question, Counselor. As I mentioned earlier, there were multiple people on these video call, and at some point, there was more than one person asking questions at a time. I don't normally think of things in the but-for paradigm. Perhaps that's a legal think, but it's not normally how I think as a forensic pathologist. So what I clarified for the U.S. Attorney and the Federal Bureau of Investigation was what happened to Mr. Floyd and that he experienced a cardiopulmonary arrest in the context of law enforcement subdual restraint and neck compression. It was the stress of that interaction that tipped him over the edge given his underlying heart disease and toxicological status. That was also clarified in a letter from Hennepin County Attorney to the U.S. Attorney. I want to say within a few days of that meeting because of the confusion around how the meeting was run and the way those questions were asked. Defense counsel, fair enough, thank you. Again, the labeling this death as a homicide. That is a medical determination you made, correct? Dr. Baker, correct. Defense counsel, it's not the same standard as the legal standard, agreed? Dr. Baker, I don't even know what the legal standard is. But there are two different worlds. Defense counsel, Okay, now in terms of your, again, involvement in this case, you have actually testified twice in connection with other proceedings, right? Dr. Baker, yes. Defense counsel, regarding the death of Mr. Floyd, right? Dr. Baker, yes. Defense counsel, and the first of those testimonies occurred 20th of August, 2020. Dr. Baker, yes. Defense counsel, you understand those were transcribed and under oath, correct? Dr. Baker, correct. Defense counsel, you have had an opportunity to review those transcripts. Dr. Baker, I have. Defense counsel, the first time you testified in connection with the death of Mr. Floyd, at any point do you recall saying I have to defer to some other specialty? Dr. Baker, I believe I said that multiple times. Defense counsel, the first time you testified or the second time you testified? Dr. Baker, I recall it was much more frequent the second time. I don't, I don't recall how often it happened the first time, if at all. 
Defense Counsel, in terms of the placement of Mr. Chauvin's knee, would that explain anatomically why Mr. Floyd, would that anatomically cut off Mr. Floyd's airway? Dr. Baker, in my opinion, it would not. Defense counsel, did you testify extensively about the significance of the coronary arteries and the heart disease? Dr. Baker, I'm not sure what you mean by the word extensively. Counselor, I, if we need to pull up the transcript, we can. I'm not sure what it means in this context. Right? So, let me take a break here. They refresh Dr. Baker's recollection by showing him his earlier testimony. Right? So, his testimony continues. Defense counsel, does it refresh your recollection? Dr. Baker, it does. Defense counsel, what was the problem with the coronary arteries in this context? Dr. Baker, I believe it's essentially the same answer I gave the jury earlier, which is because of the degree of narrowing in Mr. Floyd's coronary arteries, they have a limited ability to supply extra blood in muscle and oxygen to his heart muscle when he needs it. On top of that, he got a larger heart than a man his stature would normally have because he's hypertensive. And so that heart is gonna need more oxygen, which this coronaries have a limited ability to deliver. Let me point out, that's how it's typed out. Defense counsel, and how do you think the introduction of methamphetamine to that scenario impacts? Dr. Baker, again, I can only give that a high level answer as a forensic pathologist. I don't treat living people who have methamphetamine toxicity. Toxicity. But my understanding is methamphetamine is hard on the heart. It's going to increase heart rate. It's going to increase the work of the heart because it's a stimulant. Defense counsel, and in the circumstances of this particular case, in terms of a person with an enlarged heart, narrowing of the arteries, right? And how does the introduction of methamphetamine affect that? Dr. Baker, and as I just said, it increases the heart rate. It increases the work of the heart. It's not something that I, as a forensic pathologist, would want to see in the blood of someone that has heart disease. Defense counsel, do you describe it as a multifactorial process? The death of Mr. Floyd, Dr. Baker. That certainly sounds like something I would have said. Yes. Let me just say, I'm not going to read any more. It's clear that Dr. Baker felt that the fentanyl and methamphetamine usage contributed to Floyd's death. He did not find asphyxiation, right? There's simply no finding of asphyxiation or blocked airways, right? Given this testimony, which basically boils down to Floyd had a heart attack, right? Floyd had a compressed neck, not a blocked airway, right? Given this testimony, I don't know how a lay jury, beyond a reasonable doubt, can convict the defendant of murder or manslaughter. Right? You get the feeling from this testimony, and this is the doctor who did the autopsy. 
right? The other experts did not. This is the autopsy doctor, right? He works for the state side of the ledger, in this case of the state of Minnesota versus Chauvin. Right, this doctor thought that George Floyd's heart just gave out. Right, understand, there's a difference between George Floyd dying in police custody and George Floyd dying because of police custody. Folks, it's hazy here. It's hazy. Let me also say too, the placement of Chauvin's knee matters. This is a doctor who finds that the knee did not block Floyd's ability to breathe. In my opinion, the prosecution can't come back from this testimony. They just simply can't. That's how I see it. I don't know what the jury's going to do. I understand the political climate is anxious. There's been a cop shooting while this trial was happening. Right? Again, that cop shooting, white cop, black victim. I've spoken to many of my friends, most of whom feel that this is a slam dunk case for the prosecution. I'm sure there are going to be some people on the jury who feel the same way. But in my opinion, reading parts of the file, the evidence is just not there to support it. Right? This looks to be a situation where George Floyd did pass a bad bill. So this is a lawful arrest. He hasn't been profiled, right? He passes a counterfeit bill. The people in the store come out, ask him to make payment. He does it. He's in a car. When they get him out of the car, George Floyd, who's just been in a car, doesn't want to go in the police car and gives a reason. He says he's claustrophobic, even though he's just been in a car, right? He then starts saying he can't breathe. Folks, that's before he's on the ground. Ask yourself if being prone on the ground by itself is inherently dangerous, especially when your airway is not blocked. So to me, this testimony is consistent with a stressful situation involving a guy with pulmonary problems, with heart problems, who also is dealing with the effects of fentanyl and methamphetamine, neither of which helps his physical condition. So yes, he certainly died in police custody. No one has proven to me beyond a reasonable doubt, certainly not this testimony, that he died because he was deprived oxygen due to blocked airwaves, right? Let's remember, if the policeman is making a lawful arrest and something goes wrong, because of a pre-existing condition that the arrestee has, I don't believe that's murder. Not murder two, not murder three. Quite frankly, I don't believe that's manslaughter. I know there's a witness the prosecution presented who testified that a healthy person would have died if handled the way Chauvin handled George Floyd. I don't believe that for one second. Right? There's nothing here 
in this autopsy that shows that George Floyd had blocked airways. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. More importantly, in the comment section of this video, I'm going to post the link to the transcript that I've just read. There's more. There's more. Right? I encourage everyone to go look it up. Let me also point out, too, that I picked CNN for a reason. Because a lot of people have concerns about the authenticity of things posted on other websites. I assume CNN is a site that we at least can believe presented this, in my opinion, unfavorable to the prosecution transcript accurately. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.